Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Stacy, and I'm a bookseller and the events coordinator at Belmont Books. Belmont Books, for those of you who are not familiar with us, is an independent and locally owned bookstore in Belmont, Massachusetts. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have a number of virtual events coming up, including Gail Carson Levine on August 27th, and Yolanda Strangers and Jenny Kennedy launching their new book, The Smart Wife, Why Siri, Alexa, and Other Smart Home Devices Need a Feminist Reboot on September 1st. So that should be a lot of fun. You can register for these and our other events on our website, belmontbooks.com, which is where you can also purchase Heidi's book. If you have any questions for Heidi or Tova during or after the presentation, please type them into the Ask a Question section, and we will get to as many questions as we can. We're very excited to welcome Heidi and Tova. I want to tell you a little bit about them, and then I will turn the event over to them. Heidi Pittler is the author of the novels The Birthdays and The Daylight Marriage. She has been the series editor of the Best American Short Stories since two, <clears throat> excuse me, 2007 and the editorial director of Plimpton, a literary studio. Her writing has been published in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Huffington Post, Plowshares, and the anthologies. It occurs to me that I am America, New Stories, and Art and Labor Day, True Birth Stories by today's best women writers. She lives outside Boston. In addition to her memoir, The Book of Separation, Tover Mirvis is also the author of three novels, Visible City, The Outside World, and The Ladies Auxiliary, Auxiliary, excuse me, a national bestseller. Her essays have appeared in various publications, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Huffington Post, and Poets and Writers, and her fiction has been broadcast on NPR. She lives in Newton, Massachusetts with her three children. And without further ado, I would like to turn the event over to them. Hi everyone, it's nice to, I guess, not actually see you, but know that you are there in some form virtually and to be here with Heidi, my wonderful friend who I've had the pleasure of being in a writing group with for many years and now just someone who is such an important member of the Boston literary world and at large. And, you know, one of the things I've been thinking so much about um, during these pandemic times is both how hard it is to read and how much I need to read, how much reading is this, the only way really out of the moment. And I read Heidi's book several years ago, but I had the pleasure of rereading it now in its final form. And what struck me most was the way it both, it carried me away from the right now. I did not feel that I was stuck in my house. I didn't feel that constant sense of the questions of our day. And yet I think what the book does so so wonderfully and, and so brilliantly is that it is also about the day. It's both it's both transportive and yet it addresses so many of the burning questions of today. And I, I thought it was just amazing how you were able to do both those things. And we'll talk a lot more about that after, but I think Heidi's gonna read first from the book to give you a taste of it. And then Heidi and I are gonna talk a little bit about her book, about the writing process. I said we might discuss dogs if it comes down to that because I have a new puppy and Heidi is a longtime puppy owner. And then Heidi, and then we'd be happy to take, we're going to take questions and just open the conversation up more widely. Did you want to read? Thank you so much, Tova. Thank you for being here. Um, if you don't know Tova's writing, you should run out right now and, and find it. Her latest book is The Book of Separation, and it is beautiful. We are in a writing group together, and um, it, it's really one of the most beautiful memoirs I've read, and one of the most true things I've ever read, which is a rare, a rare thing these days, truth. Um, I'm just going to read the beginning of my book. It's, um, this is a book about a ghostwriter. I think that's probably all you need to know. Um, I once saw a woman in the library pick up a biography of Mother Teresa. A few seconds later, she returned it to its display, and next, she reached for a Kennedy nephew's memoir. The title, The House That Uncle Jack Built, was printed in a faux handwritten scrawl above the nephew's name itself set in a bold Baskerville, twice as large as the title. The book could have been called Why I Love Pants. It was the man's last name that would move copies. After eyeing the front and the back, the woman tucked her hair behind one ear and read the first page. I took the woman to be in her early 40s like me. Dressed in athletic pants, a Fendi t-shirt, and salmon-colored sneakers, she may, been, she may have been just summering here in the Berkshires. I stayed less than a pace away and tried to catch a glimpse of her reaction to the moment that Peter Kennedy, as a child, stuck his hand into the eternal flame, 
quote, immediately searing three fingers. A cemetery official marched over, called me a little brat, and ordered my whole party to leave, not knowing my relationship to the deceased, end quote. What ineffable quality made people want to keep reading a book after only a paragraph or two? At the time, I was reading a how-to book on teaching your baby to sleep. My goal was for my son and me to get more than three hours of rest without waking. I was also halfway through a book on the ins and outs of single parenting. In my arms, my son chose that moment to eject his, to eject his pacifier and shriek in a manner both rhythmic and alarming in its goat-like tenor. The woman glanced up, and what she saw was a short, bleary-eyed person staring back at her, another woman with shoulder-length, unruly, reddish-gray hair, and an inconsolable baby dressed in a Red Sox t-shirt and a diaper. Cat had stood up on my jeans 10 minutes earlier, and the left leg was still wet where I had rinsed it in the bathroom. The woman's eyes went between me and my son while I tried to quiet him. I bobbed up and down and made pressurized wave noises in the ear, but to no avail. In order to give her some peace, I headed to the front lobby, at last reinserting my son's pacifier once I found it lodged in the neck of my hoodie. When the class settled, I turned to see a librarian checking out the Kennedy book for the woman. I was pleased, nearly triumphant. She headed toward the entrance where we now stood, and a man bypassed her, making her stumble against us. Excuse me, I said, although it was she who had bumped into my son. I hope you like that book. I hear it's good. I don't have my wallet on me, she said. She kept her eyes on my old flip-flops. What? I said. I can't give you anything, she said. What? No, I said. I laughed a little, so taken aback that I could not think of what to say next. She reached for her phone and her handbag and hurried out the door. I stood there with class in my arms. Had I not signed a non-disclosure agreement, I'd like to think that I would have asked her to please, in the future, try to avoid these snap judgments of people. Maybe I would have asked her to check her assumptions about class. I don't know. At the very least, I would inform her that I was the one who had written the book in her hands. I love that opening. You know, I always, I'm so curious, Heidi, where the where the seed of the book came from, where the, the interest in ghostwriters lay for you. I always feel like every book has, there's like that kernel or seed that I feel like I can always point to in a novel and say like, that's where it is for me. Like, that's the thing that I had to write about, whether it's an experience or a question, some little thing that I, I know is in there, even if it's not visible to everyone else. And I'm curious for you where where the book came from, what it emerged from for you, and and you know, where, where did it begin? Well, so I think there were a few odd, you know, steps toward this book for me. The first one was that my last book was, was a little bit darker and, um, Conflicted in certain ways, and I wanted to write something lighter. I wanted to write something with an element of satire, and I wanted to write about someone who just wanted to be happy. So that was my first step. And then my next step was that I wanted to write about my job as the series editor of the Best American Short Stories. Is I'm kind of a worker bee. I work with a higher profile person every year, a big famous writer. We choose the 20 best stories in the country. Um, and, and that relationship has always interested me, the, you know, the worker bee and the public face of something. Um, I, I couldn't write about that, obviously, and I grafted, on, grafted it onto the ghostwriter relationship and, and needed much more drama. Um, my life is no, not nearly as dramatic as Allie's is, mm -hmm. um, nor is my relationship with my guest editors. But that seemed like that was the next step. And then I just really liked the idea of relationships between women and how these friendships and working relationships kind of are a almost a tennis match of power sometimes or and surprising in their ways how, how power can creep up and be uh, morph as time goes on in these projects so these things all came together um, I, I knew I wanted them both to be mothers I knew I wanted to be about motherhood I really wanted to poke fun at um, parenting guides and all the all the rules of you have to be this and do this as a parent because I feel like you know it, parenting is a lot like writing in some ways as is motherhood and I think that one of the biggest lessons for me is to treat my kids like individuals and treat each moment as its own moment and writing is kind of the same thing so I'm going on and it, probably answering all the questions out there, so I'll shut up yeah well it's, it's so interesting what you say about motherhood I I have such a visceral reaction to my memories of those parenting books. I have such a clear memory of 
my oldest son, who's 21, being a new baby. And, you know, I diligently had read every book and I studied them all and I had the stack next to me. And I, I remember just the feeling of the only thing I know for sure is that whatever I'm doing is wrong. That feeling that there were so many opinions and it was almost like I froze in the face of so much certainty about how to, you know, whether he should, you know, how he should sleep and what he should eat and how I should respond in each moment. It's sort of this abundance of, of information about how you're supposed to be. And yet in the moment, I don't, sometimes it's less helpful to have any of that. It's just that overwhelm, the feeling of I am wrong. Whatever it is, I'm wrong. I know that was my strategy. Exactly. And, and, and that real feeling of you're trying to exert a system and, and some kind of control on over something that's uncontrollable. I have twins and when they were babies, I remember having a clipboard it was this meticulous chart of when they slept all day long. You know, I was trying to track them when they went to the bathroom, what they ate. It was like every single thing they did. And it stressed me out if I missed something. It felt, and then I think when I eventually let, you know, eventually you let that go and some of the terror of you're responsible for these little babies and it somehow is okay. But I'm I love I love, I, the I love the depiction in, in your novel of the mother son relationship of the, you know, the way that Allie sort of has this sense, this self-consciousness about what her child is eating. I you know, remember so clearly my child drank apple juice and that was like my great shame that we did juice. And I, you know, that feeling that you are bad somehow because it was only supposed to be water, you know, and I knew that. And yet that I felt like you just so beautifully captured that sense of maybe the, the goal, the idealized version of who you can be. And yet Allie not being able to reach that. And then what was so, I think, poignant was that she wasn't able to reach it because the expectations presumed money and help, you know, that they presumed so many things, but what it takes to feed the all organic snack or to be available. And I, I felt like that, that way in which you were really able to look at how, how money and class are part of those, dis, those choices that are supposedly made, the, the baby stores that sell luxury items, as if that's just a gift, as if it's just choosing that, as opposed to being able to choose that. I would, can you write that somewhere that I just feel like you summed up the entire book so eloquently and perfectly. Okay. Can you rewrite, or, or I just want that in writing. That was I'm going to go write you a review. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go on Amazon as we speak. Okay. On Amazon and Goodreads, please. And good Thanks. Of course. Five stars, uh, but Five no pressure. Stars. Right, right. But that, I, mean, I, I love that it's a parented in the way that it's, it's, you know, and also I feel like it's satire, but it's also so heartfelt. It didn't, it felt like it was both at the same time, that sense of you feel the struggle of a mother so much. You know, I tried to make it straight satire and I, I can't, you know, my earnestness always pokes its way in somehow. And um, it, a book is what it is. It, it, you know, it has to become what it wants to be. So it is a weird sort of hybrid. Right, that's sense. But I love the idea that book becomes what it's going to be. Maybe like a child does as well. That sense. Yeah, that I know. I like this prolonged metaphor. You can parent. You can parent them all you want, yeah. you know, and they will become the. Ultimately, I think they become their themselves. And you know, I always yeah. think about fiction writing. That sense that this, in some ways, it feels so much like parent parenting. That feeling of I will rest control over you if I can only somehow contain you. Novel. And maybe they do best when they run, they run free, or when you, when you cannot contain yeah. them, when they begin to take off in their own direction, and they begin to have those moments where you, you see, oh, this is who you want to be. This is who, who you're supposed right. to actually be. Right, right, right. Exactly. It's a mm -hmm. lot of, um, you know, I spoke to. This is different but similar. We're going to just extend this metaphor out a little longer. I spoke to Curtis <laughs> Sittenfeld yesterday. Who wrote a book about uh, called Rodham about Hillary Clinton, and she writes about how the how the female politician is both a vessel and a proxy, and it's kind of again like what we are as writers and as mothers. We are sort of there and not there, and your job is to guide something almost invisibly, and, and, and just to sort of be there and not be there. And it's it's a really tricky thing to do. Right. It's fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating your character having a female a female senator candidate. You know. You're I don't, I don't want to give away too much of what happens in the book, but I don't think it's a spoiler to say yeah. this: the woman whose book is being ghostwritten becomes ends up running for the Senate, and it's so it feels so timely of the moment of how we view female politicians and what we require right. of them. And I'm wondering how you feel watching the you know sort of the the endless play out of how female politicians are treated in the conversation around that right now. Um, will you will you share what you said to me right before about your vote T-shirt? Yeah, so 
know, I, I, it occurred to me that tonight is the RNC, and I don't know actually what time she comes on, but in some ways I'm up against Melania Trump tonight. It felt like I had to wear this. Um, and we're so in it right now, even though it's a noisy time and there's a lot of news. Um, you, you see this stuff, you know, you, you see the manufacturing of, of both male and female candidates, but especially Kamala Harris, especially Nikki Haley, you know, um, it, it's just, it, it, it writes itself. It, you know, one hardly doesn't need to write a book about how, how predictable this stuff is, but how women are so judged on their looks and are they soft enough? Are they too soft? Are they hard enough? Are they too hard? You know, there's no way to win. And, and also judged on completely different criteria from men, um, you know, especially now, if you look at sort of what's, uh, what's running, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't say the most evolved version of masculinity that we've ever witnessed in history, but I won't say any more about That's that. That's so delicately put, <laughs> not the most evolved. <laughs> right. I, mean, I, can, I can, you know, yeah. Right. <laughs> it was, it was, it was both. That's, I like the shirt position and I like the period. I don't want to point to that. It's like under my armpit kind of, but I just feel like, I don't know. I just sort of like the shirt. So it seemed like a good shirt to wear tonight. Exactly. You know, one of the things I thought so much about in reading the book was how how you were really addressing the, the, the current moment. And I think it's such an interesting question for so many novels that that sense of do you write about the moment we're in? People have talked a lot about it in terms of the pandemic. You know, do you set it, is this novel pre-pandemic or whatever post pandemic hopefully there is a post-pandemic and whatever that looks like. And I remember it felt so similar to writing a New York novel about and thinking about 9-11 in that way. My third novel is set in Manhattan. And I remember yeah. I felt like I had to decide, does this book take place before 9-11 or after? And if it's after, do I have to mention it? Is there some way you have to give almost like a nod or some way to acknowledge that this has happened? And I thought it was so interesting how your book engages so directly with issues that I think if I'm remembering the timeline correctly of your writing it, were probably unfolding as you were writing it. And I'm curious how, it almost seems like you must have been adding things in as they were happening. I was curious how that timeline played out for you and how you were able to, to not just capture the moment, but really reflect on it, you know, to really have a sense of distance almost and, and perspective on events that, were, that must have been happening right around you as you were writing it. You know, it was, it was really tough and, um... I started this book in mid 2015 before my last one came out and you know Trump had not announced his candidacy yet it was the very early days of any of this and then and I had a pretty clear idea that this was going to be about class politics gender and this woman and she lived a life a certain way and she was going to be ghosting for a potential candidate and then it was like some warped version of something came true and I just felt like, can I write this book anymore? I don't even know how to, it was a real struggle. And, and um, it just, you know, that the, what was happening in the world was a struggle, but also the rate of change was a struggle because it felt like the world was changing so quickly. With Trump, with, with what was going on around the country, with what was going on at the border, it just felt like, where do we look? You know, we, we still are in that. Where do you keep your eyes? Where's the horizon? Where's the still point? It, it doesn't exist or something right now. Um, mm -hmm. So the most useful thing to me was, well, there were two things. One is my editor, who I thank constantly, but who helped me kind of dot these things in without without letting them flood the narrative and letting them overtake mm -hmm. it. So that one, you know, it was really great to have a, a really smart, objective pair of eyes. And a good editor is worth so much. Um, and the other was to set an end date to just say it's going to stop toward the end of 2017, whatever happens after that, I'm not going to cover the midterms. I'm not going to, there's a certain amount you can't let in. You need time to, to process some of it. And I still sort of think, did I get it right? Is this going to seem dated in a year or two? Um, I, I, it might. And again, I, I certainly didn't think we would all be sitting uh, in during a, a global pandemic while people are reading this. So it, it does feel like, oh my God, you know, the, the quaint kind of problems of yesteryear, the, the children at the border, and you know, um, I'm being obviously facetious. Um, it's just so hard to know. And at some point you give up trying to, um, trying to write the news and you just get back to writing a story and writing characters and, and, and get back to this, these lives on the page, which are different and kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing. It's a, it's, it's a tricky needle to thread. 
And I feel like that also with Me Too. You, I feel like there's sort of the early rumblings of Me Too, the Me Too movement in the book, where it really, you know, ends before before that you know movement really fully came out. But you feel the little, the small little warning signs in the the book she's written. And I thought that was really interesting to see the ways before we considered a movement or before it sort of galvanized the attention it later did. I feel like you just see those slight ripples, which I thought was really so well done. Thank you. Yeah, it was, I love, okay, you have a dog. We're just going to say quickly. I'm so sorry. I have a new puppy. And no. I feel like now does no. not want my children being caged. It's my puppy who is hopefully going to remain <laughs> off the screen. <laughs> no, I will. At some point, you're going to need to show him and I'll maybe okay, show him. Okay, I will, but maybe at the end, because he's very gentle maybe for me, it might yeah. do me in, because I'm, I'm, you know, it's been intense. <laughs> So, so Me Too, uh, the Me Too movement, um, yes, that was a very tricky one. Um, you know, this, a subtext of this book is it's about female complicity and how um, we, we uphold the system of sexism. And I, I mean, it's not the primary, you know, it's not the primary agenda. There is no agenda. It's a story. But, you know, it, I was exploring that and I, I wanted to have, I want wanted to write a character who didn't feel comfortable, felt more comfortable as an anonymous person than someone on Twitter or Facebook telling a mm -hmm. Me Too story and looked up to them and really admired these people, but wasn't going to be one of them. I thought this was someone who, for whom it was more complicated, um, not, not which side she's on. She's, you know, very clearly a feminist, very clearly mm -hmm. supports these women, very clearly against the men that are doing certain things, but she might not have been a, one of the last Status advocates or activists, and um, for reasons of financial issues, I think, for reasons of class, for reasons of the fact that she needs to pay the bills, and this is what she does to make money. And I think that intersection of certain issues is interesting, and, and class, an issue that's not all that often explored in fiction in a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. So that interested me. Yeah. One of the other things, you know, one of the things that I felt so moved by as well was the question, not just of complicity or power, what we do to each other, but what we need from each other. This question yeah. of what, what care we each need from one another. And I, you know, I felt for Ali so many times, the sense of being alone. And I think we probably have all felt that so many times, that sense of if I'm in need, who will be there for me and who do I have around me? And I felt as, you know, she, in the beginning of the book, her parent, her mother and stepfather move, and you sort of see the peeling away of a support system. And it made me think so much about, is it Laura talk female politicians, the it takes a village slogan, the sense of her losing that village, losing the sense of people being there for one another. And the question of how do we do it alone? What happens when you find yourself in a position where you have to do so much more alone than you thought you would have to do? And there's both the power in being able to do it. I think Allie prides herself on being able to, and yet there's an enormous cost that comes in having to do so many things on your own. Right, right, and you know, this is, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, I mean, it can be seen, I didn't write it this way, but as a metaphor for women in this country right now, we've lost a lot of support, that we're sort of all on our own in a certain way, whether it's through, and not just as women, as people of color, as, you know, there's a lot of people that have been left to fend for themselves right now, and it's a very scary thing. Um, but the flip side of that is you see on more grassroots levels, um, Black Lives Matter rising up and these, mm -hmm. and these movements, these villages in another way, um, really coming together and supporting each other, neighborhoods coming together, um, which I think is incredibly moving. But yeah, she's, she, this, the, the movement of this book is sort of her desperately trying to support her son and losing her support systems and wondering where to find them and, and being surprised by where they show up. I think, you know, the, the I didn't, this title I didn't pick lightly. I, it was a way to sort of think, how do we understand those around us? What kind of labels do we stick on them and dismiss them or let them in based on these labels? And the, the people that end up supporting her are not the people that I hope that the reader or she would have expected. Um, right. And I, you know, I'm glad you mentioned it about the title because I love the way that imper there's imp obviously the impersonation of Ali be you know, for a ghostwriter, but there were so many other ways impersonation played out. And even within the self, the sort of there's a mm -hmm. refrain about if you're afraid to do something, pretend, you know, fake it and act like yeah. you know what you're doing. And I, I think so many of us do that so often, that sense of the feeling like an imposter, feeling like I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Certainly as a parent, there 
during the mm -hmm. pandemic, there have been so many moments when the kids have said, can we do this? And I'd be like, I don't know. I have never done this before. I do not know how to navigate us through these waters of a pandemic and that feeling that you somehow are supposed to know, you know, to offer something to your kids when, when you yourself feel like I don't know what to do in this moment and how scary those can be. I know. Can we please, I wish you had that picture of you who got on an airplane to go down to Florida wearing what looks like a hazmat suit. It was, my, my husband, for a variety of reasons, is in Florida for the pandemic and he works there. He was going back and forth. And so I flew there in July before the travel ban, I should say. But I, I was the most geared up person on the plane. I mean, I mm -hmm. was triple mask with goggles. People stayed away from me. They thought that woman doesn't look 100%. I also had a little spray bottle of Purell. I kind of sprayed if anyone came close. So I was hardcore. <laughs> but, um, but, but that sense of like, you know, you're doing something you feel like I, who would have thought this feels so risky? And I looked, you know, I took a selfie of myself and I looked at the picture and I thought I have left planet earth. I mean, I am in an, I'm, I'm traveling wow. out of outer space. I mean, I, look like right. I am, and just that feeling of where are we? How have I landed somewhere where this is my traveling wear? This is my outfit to wear. Right. But the, I guess the strange- yeah, I mean, Go ahead. The, I guess the strange is that where we find ourselves sometimes, just the, the unfathomability of it at the moment. Well, and that's what makes me glad that this book still feels relevant, because I think that that is a sort of theme that withstands time in some way, is the disguises we put our we you know we put on to get through the day and that works somehow that when you start acting like something you become that thing, whatever for better or for worse right. uh, that's how we move forward when we get stuck that's how we get through difficult times is pretending we're okay and then you are okay right and my kids and I always refer to like early pandemic we're like oh we were so naive in early pandemic you know remember in April we thought it would be fun to like clean out the closets because we were going to be here for like three weeks and, um, and like that sense that we I think we have learned, we have learned somehow, you know, now we're like, we're in, we are seasoned pandemic people now. We know, oh, you know the sense that you, we learned that. that. Who would have thought we would have learned all of these things or how to do so many, so many different things. And another, yeah. one of the other questions I wanted to ask you that I don't want to forget because it's been on my mind all day. Um, the question of Lana. I was wondering if you could talk about her evolution as a character. And Heidi and I were in a writing group, as we said. And I I guess I must have read a draft. Was it three years ago? I don't know. Time is weird. It could have been, you could tell me it was a month ago. Was it? I don't know. Several years ago. And I, Lana has evolved a lot in terms of you know your, your depiction yeah. of her. And I was interested if you could talk about how how she came to take on the shape she does and how you made those decisions to sort of transform because I feel like it says so much about the writing process, the way the way each draft adds a layer and we change things as they go until it feels like, oh, I felt like, of course, this is who she was. I feel like this is, of course, who she was all <laughs> along. And I, I think it's one of the amazing things about the writing process that there's that sense of how could it have been any way other than this? But maybe you want to just talk about this with the transformations she went through? <laughs> yes, she went through a huge trend. I mean, you know, the funny thing is, is that she's supposed to be elusive because that's the whole problem. You know, that's one of the central conflict points of the book. So she's supposed to be elusive. So there's this frustrating thing as a reader about reading about someone who's elusive because you can't quite get them. So there was always that. Um, that said, she, she also needed to be someone that started with a public image that needed to be changed. She needed to be seen as other in some way, not your typical mom, not your typical electable woman in some ways. So she did begin in a very different way. She was other and she was um, other racially and sexually. And, and we, you know, I kind of just put that on the page and I, and, and so Lana's job was to make her seem less different in these ways. And it felt like a minefield and one that really wasn't mine to write. So my editor and I went back and forth about it and we sort of thought, what, how can we make her seem you know, not an obvious candidate and, and in a way that's, you know, culturally sensitive and feels like an okay story to tell. And so what we landed on is she's from um, Bucharest. She's Romanian. She's a little bit punk. She had blue hair. She, you know, um, is not the person that you would think of as, a, you know, a soft, a soft character. She's kind of a badass feminist, and um, and she needs, you know, she's she's mouthy on Twitter. She doesn't watch her language, and she needs some smoothing down. 
So I think that kind of worked in the end for her. And, and it, it sort of took on a life of its own. I think, you know, there's, she's doing a lot of her own impersonation and assumptions that I, I wanted the reader to make about her um, that some don't be true, as well as Allie. Um, and that was that was fun to play with, the kind of immigrant story that we make a lot of assumptions about and often it's not true. So um, again, what my hope is with this book that it makes people sort of look at a stranger on the street and say, well, I don't know everything about you. Or, or God forbid, we look at someone from another political party and say, maybe you are different from what I think. And maybe that's the starting point, that you can't know everything about someone based on two things about them. Right. It's, I mean, it's what I think fiction really, really does. I feel like fiction really does. I feel like fiction is really, does. I feel like really, I'm hearing like weird feedback. 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 I'm hearing like weird Are you hearing it? Or? Are you hearing it? Now you're good. You sound good. Okay. Okay. There's like some weird okay. echo going There's on. There's like some weird echo going on. Okay. Um, my, um, I feel like fiction my, is really so I feel like fiction is really so much about the idea of that you see the outside and then you get the opportunity to go inside. That you see the outside and you get the opportunity to go inside. We see people. We see people. We see people. We see people. In real life so many times. We can just. We can just. We can just. How do I talk to people? How do I talk to people? You know, I'll just talk a little bit about what you were just saying. Yeah. And hopefully, it will just. Yeah. Now you sound yes. good. Um, yes. Fiction. I think. Fiction. I mean, there is. You know, there is this idea that fiction has been true. Has been true. Proven true that fiction. Um, makes, you know, reading fiction makes you more empathetic, and and how that works obviously is you're reading from reading about characters who are not you. You're you're get, reading other motivations and from the viewpoint of other people. Um, you know, there's a part in my book where Lana Lana is well known partly for. Um, her work with women in poverty. And, and she's on a talk show because she, she's sort of gone viral with a video that she made of, she, she met, met a homeless woman, you know, put a secret cam, camera on her glasses so that the viewer could see life from her point of view, not just looking at her, looking from her. And, um, you know, this woman has a horrible life, but it's not the person you would think in the end and somehow man, makes it work. And th that idea really is threaded through the whole book. Um, I still hear your feedback. I'm so sorry. Is it still awful? I don't hear it now. I does it everyone else? No, now you're okay. 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 Yeah, I don't know. All of a sudden, I was like, I'm hearing myself, and then it's some weird stereo all around. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Again. Yeah. I mean, it's what I think. It's really that, but that question really is what drives me so much to write. And the novel yeah. I'm working on now takes a real life news story, and and it, you know, as my departure point, and my obsession with it has to do with the fact that. We see these people in the news. We see these characters. We, you know, we see people, public figures, or read about individuals who sort of make the news for whatever reason, and we yeah. get some information about them. But I, I'm so hungry for more. I want their inner lives. Like I want to know. And I'm so excited. I think right behind me, you can see Rodham is on my like to read list, to read pile. Like I'm so interested. No, well, in that yeah, that says I was just going to say we talked about this yesterday, and and Curtis kind of said what you know this is one of the most looked at people in the world, and and you know picked apart and misunderstood and assumed the assumptions made about her, and she said she just wanted you know to give her a voice. What did the world look like to her? What did Bill Clinton look like to her? What did Trump look like to her? And what a what a great exercise that is as a writer to step inside the head of someone who's only been looked at. Right, it feels so amazing to have even if even if it's, even if it's made up, it's, I think it still reveals something true that, and I remind yeah. us of all the things that we don't know, or yeah. I feel like the possibilities just to like, to imagine an inner life that all these people we see from the outside have vast, complicated inner world, just like we have our, for our own selves. Yeah, there's some kind of um, you know, right saying out there, but I really like it, and I can't, I'm not gonna I'm gonna botch it, but something about you know the people that you meet. Everyone has their invisible struggles, basically, right. and, you know, and, and tread lightly with them. I'm guilty of this, too. I mean, we all, right now, we're in a time where everyone's judging everyone. But, um, you know, in some ways, the pandemic, I think, has is changing that because we're all fighting the same beast. And um, right. hopefully, at the end of the day, we'll figure out a way to get rid of it. But for now, or to, to be safe from it. And I think we're getting there, but I'm not the expert, so... I will not hold forth on that. Right. And what have you? What what books were important to you to read while you were writing this? Were there novels or nonfiction books that were important to you as you wrote? 
I'm looking over in my corner. There's a book called um, How Women Win, which is a history of Emily's List, um, a, a, a female, a sort of political action committee that supports female candidates, which was really interesting, sort of how they help groom women candidates. Um, I, I talked to a lot of people. I interviewed ghostwriters. I interviewed political consultants. I read a lot of news. Um, I actually tried to stay away from fiction about it. I, when I'm writing fiction about something, I like to have kind of a clean palette and not to um, and, and just, just to kind of keep with my own voice. And this book was very weird to me. It, it, it I wanted it to feel like nonfiction, and I was very, I, I was very aware of that the whole time. I wanted data in there. I wanted actual information. I wanted it to have that rhythm of daily life with, with you know texts and DMs and the kind of mm -hmm. the way that that real life works because I, I wanted it to just feel I, you know I could see it almost as like a gritty video it just I didn't want to you know I didn't want it to be gauzy and romantic I didn't want to romanticize poverty or single motherhood or any of this even though it has its certain loving moments I hope um, but I it just mm -hmm. it had a style that was important to me so that meant keeping certain fiction out of my head. Mm -hmm. and and I read so much fiction for my job as Best American Short Stories person and Clinton editorial director. I'm constantly reading fiction. So that I don't I don't choose what I read, but I'm lucky to read a lot of really wonderful stuff. Mm. And you said you know early on that you wanted to write a book that was more less dark or fun and yeah. or lighter, but did, did it feel did it make the writing process more enjoyable to write something more I wouldn't call it light because it really feels complicated yeah. and dark in its own way, but yeah. different than, than daylight marriage. And so I was curious if, if it maybe, yeah. does it make it more, more, does it make it more enjoyable? You know, there are moments there, you know, the satirical moments are fun. And it's really, it was fun to write about, you know, Disney about, um, there's a scene kind of early on where she has to take her, she takes her son to Disney. She's a Disney world. She's down some money and has to say no to him 800,000 times. And, and that was strangely, it just felt, I did a lot of research about how Disney World works, and it was, you mm -hmm. know, just think little scenes like that. I, I have a scene where I'm sort of taking down reality TV <laughs> and the show, you know, the the, the kind of um, super nanny shows. So that was fun. The, her ghostwriting jobs, even though they're sort of dark, they're sort of fun because it's for me, it's a really, you know, I'm sure you have this too, where each book gives you new challenges. So mm -hmm. in this one, it was a bit Hall of Mirrorsy. Um, I'm writing from the point of view of a ghostwriter who's writing from the point of view of, you know, early on right. in the book, a jerky guy, not kind of, a very jerky guy. And so she's just trying to sort of put away every ounce of restraint and femininity she has and just kind of go, okay, you know, I have to, I just have to brag and boast and posture on the page. And that was fun. You know, it's, it's like acting, which is what she talks about it being acting, but, you know, once removed. So that was kind of fun. Right, it's interesting how each book has its own problem to solve. I feel like there's this the feeling of like what will be the thing with this book? One of an early yeah. pandemic when you know I felt like we, we did a jigsaw puzzle. It was like, oh, you have to do you know your, your requisite puzzle for the pandemic. And my kids, of course, had no interest in doing it. So I worked it over the course of two months very slowly. <laughs> but I would work yeah. it when I usually when I was very stressed out was when I would go sit down at the puzzle and it really felt yeah. so much like writing a book. I felt like there was a problem I had to solve and I just had to work it out. Mm -hmm. And I feel like each book has those moments, that sense of the, tang the, the piece to untangle or the thing to wrap my mind around, some mm -hmm. feeling that if I can just get this piece under control or just get this section, somehow I'll be able to see the whole of it. I'll be able to somehow hold the book in my head in, in some form, even that, then it goes away very quickly once you take your eye off of it. But for that moment, for that one mo minute when you get yeah. to hold it, you feel like you- There's so much problem it. solving, yeah, for sure. Right. I mean, it, it's, um, and it's frustrating and every book feels like, oh God, I'm, this is the one I'm gonna get lost in the woods and never get out. Right. Right. You know, how am I supposed to know how to write this book? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and that's the point is that if there's no discovery for you, there won't be discovery for the reader or for the characters. You have to get lost. Right. And to, and to, right. And to allow yourself to get lost. I feel like just those moments you feel like, why am I writing about this? Like, why have I arrived here? And just to, I guess it's an act of trust or just exploration or having fun, just saying, like, okay, let's see where we go. Let's see what's going to happen with this. And just, 
to sort of have some, I mean, I have some days where I just feel like, just go with it, see what it is. And other days that feel much more organized. It's like, I'm going to finish off this scene. I'm going to write their dialogue and I'm going to come to, I need this to happen so I can move to the next scene. I feel like I oscillate so much between those two, two kinds of writing, my sort of like organized self and then my like all over the place, you know, part of my writing self. Yeah, and then I, I feel like I have those two as well. And then I have the self that sits down and kind of goes word by word and sort of says, is this what I not I need it to sound like? You know, the sort of meticulous cleaning up. Is this true to this character? Is this the best way to, to say this sentence? And the worst thing is when you, you you level jump and you're doing that before you've figured out the story or the, the right. bigger picture. And I think over time you learn the story is the most important thing and that um, everything feeds that in a sense. I mean, I think that's one of the lessons over the years as a writer. It used to be, can you write beautiful sentences? And then it becomes, are you writing the best story you can tell? Does it bring the reader somewhere? Right. I've been thinking about that so much where I feel like I'm just sort of sprinting towards a draft. I feel like I know that sentence is going to need work. And three years yeah. from now, that sentence is even still in the book. If that character is still in the book, then I will deal with that problem then. But that yeah. the feeling of just, can I just put it, can I get it somehow on the page? Can I just get my story laid out? And can I get all the pieces in place? I really, I loved your plotting. I don't want to give away this plot piece. I'm not going to give too much detail about it, but there's a way in which the ghostwriter has, it has signs a confidentiality clause. And there's a question of whether that might be breached here. And then I won't say anything more than that, but in those moments where I felt the possible breach happening, I had both that, it was really the perfect sense of like, I could see how it was going to go and I hoped it wouldn't. I'd be like, no, 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 don't say that. Don't tell her. <laughs> that sense of impending doom where you still feel like you could save the situation, like you could prevent it from happening. And that sick feeling in your stomach where you know, you know, this is not going to go well. And that I think is such a great way of plotting where, where you let the reader sort of hover in that possibility really of is this, how might this play out? Is this, can we still rescue our right. characters? Well, and it was, I kind of wondered, is this, you know, could this uh, breach the agreement? Well, just, I'm trying to be cagey here. I'm right, exactly. You know, I don't want to say. Possible. Right, it could, it could, because it's a mundane moment. It's not, it's not any kind of big triumphant, blah, you know, operatic anything. It's just kind of a, a mundane thing that happens. And, um, and I did wrestle with that, but I, I, you know, I, I did enough research to make sure that I knew it could hold. And um, and I did want it to feel organic, too. I wanted to, it to feel like this is happening because of who these people are, not because of a sudden, not because of me as the writer, but they find themselves at odds in a certain way. And the only way they're going to get out of it is to do something and, and it will come back to haunt them in a certain way. But again, I think that the more interesting stories to me are not, you know, this person's good and this person's bad, this person's right or this person's wrong. It's just life is complicated. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, everyone has, ha wants the best for whoever, you know, for themselves, their children. Plugging in my laptop. Sorry, I'm plugging in my laptop, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. It's been like a chaos day here. Sorry. Sorry. You had one too. I know every day is a chaos day. It's chaos, right? It's, wait, I, I, for some of the pandemic, I feel like writing was like the saving grace. If I could just write for a few hours every day, that I somehow would keep my like escape. That would be like a point. Right. Now it's like, if I can prevent everyone from going completely bananas, I'm doing okay. So, yeah. yeah, if we're all, you know, clothed and fed, we're rock stars. I mean, it really right. is. Right, and it's a strange time to be out of the book, too, might I add. <laughs> right. You know, it's a little bit odd. But um, I, I think it, it is, the, you know, again, the great lesson, this is the night of lessons, um, is learning to just go with it and not to and try to impose too much control because you can't. <laughs> right. Which is, I think, such a lesson. I mean, I think of myself as a young mother, that feeling of that you could somehow control, that you were going to, this is how it was going to look. It was all going to be perfect and glued into the baby book in the exact perfect form. And I feel like what parenthood I think teaches you is that sense of lack of control or the way we don't control, control. It's only a pandemic teaches you that in a very, very um, obvious hit you over the head sort of way, that sense that 
you cannot control things. I found myself thinking about, well, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? And I was like, oh Thanksgiving? God, I, like, I was like, just stop. Like, that is so, that is like another century at this point. Like, that sense <laughs> of, like, let go of your planning mind, your mind that wants to know things or, or figure things out. I feel like we were forced into this mode of, of we, don't, we don't know. Like, there's not, not no. a no way. It, it really is. And it, and it, it's, it is a good thing to learn in some ways. And, you know, I think we've learned our lessons and we're ready to move on now, but I don't know that we, we have that choice. Right. So, right. I think, you know, I think we are coming to soon the question yes. and answer part. So I'm going to say if people have questions, make sure to write so that we're not sitting here looking awkwardly at you and um, ad libbing, but you no know, pressure, but very much pressure. So I'm just going to throw that out there. But, <laughs> No, you're back. I am. Um, so I'm not seeing any questions, but I would like to ask you each what you are reading now. And Heidi, I know that you have to read a lot of things um, for your other work, but what do you, if you have time to read anything for pleasure? And Tova, what are you reading for pleasure? Tova, you go first. Okay. Well, um, I, I have found that in general, when I'm able to read, that is when I've had the best days. Like when I'm able to get off my laptop and turn off my Facebook or regret the fact that someone taught me about the existence of words with friends and <laughs> to really, to really just to unplug myself and read. And so I guess like a list, um, I used to have this stack of books in my office where I'm sitting that I would also use to prop up my computer when I worked out so I could see my, like my workout class, but that's, I moved it. So, I, so I'm going to just do it from the, from memory. So I love disappearing earth. Um, by Julia Phillips, mm -hmm. Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel, Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. Um, um, look at my room. Um, I recently read, um, I read Writers and Lovers by Lily King, which I really loved. I'm about to read Rodham and the book Rage Becomes Her um, is on my reading list. Um, what else have I read? I Oh man, so many different books. Um, Trust Exercise, I've loved um, the fact of a body. I'm just sort of looking around my room. They're all like scattered in various random spaces in my room. Um, and those books have really have really been such a great place to just disappear into. It really has felt like this ability to escape, to feel like I can read a novel and and I'm I'm just not here in the same way, or I'm just able to really to just be somewhere else. And so I think those books have really, um, and I've enjoyed making these stacks while I was keeping a list for, of, you know, my of books I read. Just there's something comforting about, about seeing all the books all over me. And then they started to feel like a mess. So I had to put them back on their shelves. But just the feeling of like, that it was almost like a, like a prisoner marking lines on a wall of how many days have passed by. I feel like my books were like that for me. <laughs> Yeah, so I, right now I am in a particularly busy work phase of reading constantly. But um, in terms of books, I am my next book is Margot Livesey's book, The Boy in the Field. Um, oh, another book God. that I would recommend because it's stories and I've, I've read a lot of them is Emma Klein's new one, Daddy, is incredible. Just, inc I mean, every story, it feels like um, funny and savage and, and I, I think just so, so wonderful. Um, other books I have to look behind me here and, um, oh my God, you know what? Oh, oh Rodham, of course. And the, here's another one. Jill McCorkle's new book, Hieroglyphics, is quite wonderful. We, we spoke the other night. Um, Caroline Levitt's new book is really wonderful. I'm thinking about people who have new books out right now. Um, 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 I really want to read the Kylie Reid as well, Such a Fun Age. Really good. Uh, I know I'm missing them, and I know I'm going to think of them as soon as we turn Exactly. Off. Yeah. No, pandemic brain. It's okay. Um, we do have another question. Robin would like to know, as an unpublished short story fiction writer, what publishers might one submit to? Oh, okay. So you probably want to think about literary journals. Um, and you, the best way to do that is, and I'm just going to plug Best American Short Stories, is a really great sampler of what kind of stories are out there and who's publishing what. Um, there's a list at the back of the book of every literary journal in this country that publishes fiction. Um, read what the kind of stuff that they are publishing and make sure you send to the appropriate places. There are magazines that publish experimental stuff. There are mag magazines that go a little more realistic. Um, you know, 
every magazine has a has a website now and submittable is a thing. It's very, very easy to submit um, and have fun with it and submit a ton. I will say if you're an aspiring story writer, um, it, the, the great challenge is to toughen that skin and get you through a lot of rejection. I mean, not that I know you or your, your fiction, but most people have to submit a lot before they get published and just keep out there, keep trying and don't give up because it can be, it can be hard. Great. Anybody else? My dog is anyway, my dog. Oh, right Heidi, I'm only going to show the dog if I can tell the dog's story. Oh my oh, God. Please. You're going to tell the dog. Can I? Sorry, please. I can and can you show your, can Charlie make an appearance too or no? I'm, I'm going to have to go look for I'm him. I'm going to tell the story as I get the dog. Okay, I'm going to tell it. it. The full version of it. Oh, Toba, you stink. Oh, she okay. is just. This is Augie. I'll just talk here. This is Augie, who is part of the rescue from Puerto Rico. I'm going to tell you a story about our writers group. This is Sunny, our doggy. Oh, so we had a writers group, and in our writers group, there were six writers and four. I cannot believe writers. you're telling us. Sorry, just stop me if you don't want me to. No, tell it at this point. You have there to were talk. four people who had dogs. I was not a dog person. I was like the one who was like, oh, dogs. Okay. We're showing our dogs. But we, um, was it it's amazing. So one of our dear writer friends, Joanna, had just had a baby. And so she brought the baby to writer's group. And Heidi's doggy was a puppy. And so Augie, the puppy, saw Joanna nursing her baby and tried to nurse. And for me as a non-dog person, I was just like, oh, my. God, but then there had been an essay written by a friend of many of ours um, called I Nursed My Friend's Baby. And so we decided we were going to one up that essay by submitting an essay called I Nursed My Friend's Dog. <laughs> <laughs> horrifying. I was so deeply Oh my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh my God, this is dogs all around. So I have somehow been convinced by my daughter to become a dog person. And so I am as shocked by anyone that I have a dog, given that in writer's group, I was just stunned by dog. So cute. Wait, is it a, it's a he? It's a he. Yeah. Oh, yours? Yeah. Charlie is probably well, just like Augie. What? They really have the same ears. Right. They do. Charlie has his part Chihuahua and part Dachshund, which is one of my favorite breeds. So yeah. I'm very happy to meet him. But also, there's Sunny. Look at Sunny. You guys are Sunny. Hi, Sunny. Look. So what right. kind of dog is it? He's a Cavapuchon. He's tiny. Oh, wow. And I really know so little about dogs. So it's been I feel very in touch with my early mother self. I said to my son <laughs> Daniel, do you think we should make an obstacle course or something for Sonny in the backyard? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He's like, Mom, we don't have to plan activities for Sonny. We're not in the camp <laughs> so I felt my early mom. I was like, should we get out the arts and crafts projects? Should we sing songs? I'm reverting to my like over-functioning young mother self who feels like if we're not enrolled in like baby yoga and baby French lessons. <laughs> and That's great. <laughs> Hello, doggy. Well, thank you both for sharing your dogs and sharing sorry, yourselves. Heidi, it was a story. wonderful I'm conversation. Sorry. I'm oh, been no, out in this nasty little naughty. That was very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, thank you both for being with us and um, for Thanks. really for such an interesting conversation. And I, um, oh, we have another question from Robin. Do either of you find a recurring theme in your books? I would say for mine, probably uh, women finding their voice. I mean, it's a, it's a way, you know, through in surprising ways. That's probably my two second. Augie agrees. What about you, Paula? I feel like I'm always interested in, I think, the self and the other, like the way people function in groups to one point or another, or the gap between how what people hold inside themselves and what they share with people around them. And so it's, you know, I, I, I feel that theme comes back again and again for me. And maybe it's, it's more evident in the writing process, but you know what we were saying earlier, that, that sense that it's so frustrating when you can't know the whole story of something, when you just want to know what happened, or I want to... 
I want that access to people's heads that you just can't get sometimes and that that wish to know something to sort of maybe it's to have confirmation of something or to understand something in a in a deeper way about the sort of other yourself in relation to the other and so what I'm working on now is so different from anything else I've written, but I feel like I feel myself in it. It feels like that yeah. that some of those same questions about do you ever really know people or how do people sort of package themselves versus who they yeah. how they experience them to be, even though there's a completely separate plot and it has a totally different um it feels very different in some ways from anything I've written before, also at the same time. Oh, I'm excited to read it. Will you let me read it at some point? Oh my God, you are going to be one of my first readers. I mean, that like, I was cruising on it until <laughs> three weeks ago. I can't imagine why, but um, I had a baby. I had a baby. <laughs> right, exactly. But, um, but yeah, it's been nice to write. It just feels like you get to be, so, you know, you just can be inside some other question and you get to ask something. And I feel like there's always that obsession of obsession. Like, I'm obsessed with this story because I just yeah. need to know what happens. And the only way I'm gonna know is if I make it up. Yeah. Hold up. Where are you going? You're so jumpy. That's great. Well, thank you both. Thank, thank you everybody for coming. It was wonderful to spend this time with you and um, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you, Tova. Thank you.